you for the invitation and introduction. Um, I'm the quality assurance manager of the LOEX laboratory in uh, Quebec City. And uh, the clean rooms we have, uh, they are used for uh, tissue engineering and we uh, build products such as uh, skin and cornea in those clean rooms for early phase clinical trials, uh, for the autologous use in burn patients and patients with limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, the tissue engineering approach that was developed by our lab uh, actually uses the cell's capacity to produce their own extracellular matrix. And uh, we have shown that the stem cells remain in those tissues during the production process. So uh, I'm going to talk mostly about quality management systems and good manufacturing practice, uh, the goals and methods of these uh, two systems. And I will give two examples, uh, which are um, reagent uh, management and documentation. When you go from the research lab with your product to a GMP facility in order to produce for a clinical trial where your product is actually used in humans, you can see on the first hand uh, some differences, uh, which are uh, in the cleanliness, the environment, how the installation is built. And I show two examples. On the left hand is a picture of our research lab and uh, on the right hand is a picture of our clean room. So you see there is more gowning, there is less clutter, and uh, also the, the flow hood uh, remains the same. Uh, this is actually only the tip of an iceberg. I know I, someone spoke about icebergs earlier, so you will see more icebergs in this talk. Um, on the right hand side, you see the list of the headings of the chapters of the good, uh, medic, uh, good Manufacturing Practice Guidelines of Health Canada that are applicable to producers and distributors of drugs and cell products are considered drugs. So of the earth first, first four one we have already spoken and there are a lot more things that you don't see when you look in a clean room that you need to uh, keep in mind when you build your GMP manufacturing. First, I would like to take a step out and zoom out for, to the bigger picture. What is GMP? Good manufacturing practices provides guidance for your production process. And that, makes, that is with the goal of make sure that the product is safe. That's what Health Canada wants to know. The product is safe. It's not putting your patients at risk. Uh, in the guidelines themselves, it is written that drugs are consistently produced and controlled in such a way to meet the quality standards appropriate to their intended use. Also, the important thing here is intended use is mentioned. This is because every product is different, every therapy is different, so there, um, it is really taken into account what product you are making for which therapy to see what quality standards are applicable for your case. And in the end, this consistent production will, and the traceability, all the documentation you will do, uh, will make the manufacturing process uh, a good process and you will have uh, no problems being approved from, by Health Canada for your clinical trial. Uh, GMP is a quality management system. And in quality management, you often hear two terms, which is quality assurance and quality control. And they are sometimes mixed up and sometimes thought to be the same. This is not the case. There are really two different things. Um, quality assurance is bigger than GMP. It is really the total measures you take to ensure that the, the product has the quality of the, for the use that you want to use it in. Um, GMP is part of quality assurance and quality control is part of GMP. Quality control is that part that deals with sampling, the testing, and also the release procedures of your various steps and the end product. Quality control makes sure 
that your product has the quality that is necessary for the pro uh, uh, that is uh, satisfactory. Quality control is all about achieved quality, what you do in your process. Quality assurance, on the other hand, defines the quality that you want to achieve in your process. So uh, these are really two different things. And what does GMP do for you? Um, once you have your new product and you have your uh, preclinical information, um, you want to go to the clinical trials. In order to do that, you need to submit, as it was said earlier, a clinical trial application in order to obtain what Health Canada calls a no objection letter. This is not okay, your trial is great. It's right now we think it will work. We don't see anything that puts the patient at risk. It's not a, a really okay, it's just we're not against it. So you can start. And um, in that clinical trial application, the modules two and three, they deal with the quality information about the drug. And all these things that, you, uh, that we spoke earlier about, the, the clean room itself, you have to describe in what clean room your product is going to be produced, how you control the environment, um, what reagents are in your manufacturing process, what are the steps of your manufacturing process, what are the quality control steps during the production, and at the final batch release of your uh, products. And um, you have to have uh, uh, three runs of your production to submit it to, to Health Canada. So you have to have to done it before, before you submit your clinical trial. And you won't be able to use this in the patients. It's just a, a, th a three runs that will cost you money and time, but it will give you the confidence in the quality of your product and that your standard procedures worked and this will give you the necessary arguments to convince Health Canada that your product is safe to be used in patients. This leads me to my first example, the reagent selection. When you made your first um, doses of your uh, new cell product or biologic, you use, most of, uh, certainly used a lot of reagents that are declared for research use only. They are not for use in diagnostics and they are not for therapeutic procedures. Therefore, you can also not simply use it in the production of a product that will be uh, injected or otherwise delivered to humans. You have to change the grade of your reagent. You need to upgrade to for manufacturing use products. This can be done through pharmaceutical grade um, products. It's like if you use a drug that is available in the pharmacy for a treatment in humans, you can use it in your production process and you can declare it in your application to Health Canada that you use a safe um, drug in your manufacturing process. Or you can have USP grade. USP is the United States Pharmacopeia. It's a standard compilation of standards for drugs and uh, drug uh, products. And uh, there are um, the qualities and what tests must be performed for a drug to be used in humans. You find this information usual, usually in the USP. Also, it could be possible that you do not find the replacement for your research reagent. So what are you going to do? In order to be able to use it in a clinical trial, you will have to make a risk-based assessment on if this reagent puts the patients at risk. Um, this depends on the quality of the reagent you have available. Was it produced in GMP? Um, what are the characteristics? How was the reagent produced? If it's uh, in a chemical reaction, for example, you might need to check for common byproducts and see if these are dangerous uh, when it's once injected. Um, and also, uh, if it, uh, the reagent was produced by a microorganism, then you might add additional tests for endotoxins, mycoplasma, sterility, uh, anything that you can think of that might put the patient at risk needs to be tested if the tests are not already done on the product you want to buy. Um, another element of this risk-based assessment is the stage of the manufacturing that you want to use the reagent. If it's an early stage, then you can uh, 
argue that the reagent will no longer be in the final product because you have washed many times, you have changed the cell culture medium, or you have done several steps that will eliminate any remaining reagent uh, from your product. In a late stage uh, product, uh, it might be necessary to test for remaining reagent in the final product in order to prove that uh, your product is safe. So with increased risk come more tests, and, uh, but it means that once you qualified your reagents, you have them selected, you add them to the list of your approved reagents for your clinical trial, and it's only those drugs uh, that can be used in your manufacturing process. Once you have all your reagents, you will um, order them and uh, you, you have to have certain documents coming with your reagents, like the certificates of analysis that need to be checked and filed. You cannot just put it on, a, uh, by, on the side. You need to actually read it and see that all the, uh, the um, specifications are okay. And then you file it uh, for each reagent you receive every time you receive it. Uh, the text is an example of the certificate of analysis of our CO2 that we use in the incubators to grow our cells. And the company states that it's done in compliance with good manufacturing practice itself, and they are using validated analytical method to fill in their certificate. If, as I discussed previously, you have uh, tests to be, to be done before you can release your reagent, uh, you need to put your received uh, reagents in quarantine, which is a secure storage that prevents anyone from using the product in the uh, production process before you have cleared it for use. Once all the tests have come back and they are okay, then you can release your product and add it to your inventory. And the inventory is an important document that uh, contains batch numbers, the date of reception, the expiry date and how many units you received and also uh, cases where you fill in when you have used the units so you know at each time which reagent, which batch went into which production of your um, final product. Uh, this is important because you might get recalls from the manufacturer or you might have unexpected quality control results that make you uh, think about could a reagent be the reason for the change in your quality control results. And also, once you have delivered the therapy, uh, there could be questions from end users or patients, or Health, Can Health Canada could have an inquiries. For important samples, uh, it's important to keep um, samples for important reagents. Uh, in order to be able to test on a later stage if quality controls come um, back and they are uh, unexpected. This leads to my second um, example, the documentation. The inventory is an important document. Nothing is erased in it. You know exactly how many ingredients you had when and you need to archive this. This is part of the whole documentation system that comes with GMP. Um, that uh, GMP is part of a quality management system and this is usually defined with one document which is called the quality manual. And in that manual, the organization that is producing the drugs for clinical trials commits to the quality. They describe how GMP will be implemented in the organization and which regulatory um, guidances need to be complied with. Um, this is only one document that is the ground stone for the whole uh, documentation and quality process. Uh, the next step are the standard operating pre procedures, which are um, working instructions that are approved by quality assurance. As I said earlier, this is to define what quality we want to have in our products. And the next step is where you will have uh, thousands of are the records, which are the proof of the execution of all the manufacturing steps that uh, have been performed. And they are on each day, every time you perform a cell culture or you perform a, a production step, 
uh, you have the operators sign off with initials and date so that they can, can say, we have done this and this is the proof. And every evening the quality control department will go through those records and check that everything has been uh, done as uh, requested. The SOPs themselves have um, a structure. They come with a definition of the purpose of the, the procedure and the policies that um, are uh, required to be complied with during this uh, procedure with the definitions that are necessary uh, to understand. And the body of the document is the step-by-step -step instructions that are really detailed so you cannot be in error and uh, th that uh, your um, production is every day the same. Um, usually in our case, uh, this, the SOPs come with, filled in, with forms that will be filled in every time you perform your uh, manufacturing step. And once these forms have been filled in with dated and signed, they become records and they are kept as proof. Um, all these documents uh, are submitted to a document management system, which means that you need to have a system that tells you if an SOP has been updated, which one is the current version, which one is in effect, when were the older versions in effect. So if you have questions, you know, okay, in 2016 it was version 1, now we're at version 2. So um, all this must be known and documented. Um, the next um, slide is about the records. So, as I said, every step must be documented because for Health Canada and inspectors and auditors, if something is not documented, it, ha it has not been done. So, you, you really need to um, be careful with that. And if you uh, go through citations from uh, inspectors, the most of the time you see, okay, they fail to initialize their, their working steps, there are, in, there are signatures missing, there are dates missing. This is very frequent that you hear this kind of uh, comment. The records, once, once they are uh, compiled, are placed in a production file. Um, I wanted to add that you must see changes that you added to your records, so if you uh, Wrote, wrote a wrong data, you have to bar it in a way that it still can be read, which uh, the data that was wrong. You have to write the new data next to it. You have to add another initial and another date and a comment on why you had to change the data. So this is really very strict and important documentation and documentation that's the basis of, uh, of good GMP compliance. Uh, okay, the records are compiled in a production file, and the production file, the whole pile of it, if it took two weeks to, pro to produce, you'll have a pile of 10 centimeters of uh, records. They will all be reviewed before batch release once again, before the quality control department can uh, say, okay, this product is ready for uh, release into clinical trial. And the records are afterwards kept available for audits and inspections. Audits can come from your, the company that pays your uh, clinical trial. It can be internal audits where the quality assurance department uh, verifies that what's written in the SOP is, already, is, is really done. And um, also there can be records that are re recorded in electronic form by software, for example. Uh, the FDA has a special regulation for that. You have probably already heard of the Ominous Part 11, which is uh, short for the 21 CFR Part 11, the document that uh, deals with electronic record keeping. Um, the important thing, as with paper documents, is uh, you need to have proof that the document has not been tampered with. This means that your software has been validated, that there is no means that you can falsify by accident or um, otherwise the data. And also the uh, principle that you need to know every change that has been done uh, is implemented with something called the audit trail, where every change in the electronic document and data is timestamped and recorded by the software and kept in a file that you can review and you can see at what time 
a change was made and by which signed-in operator the change was made. Um, one thing, electronic signatures and uh, the electronic documents, they are really created by software. So electronic signatures are like password and um, username or biometrics. They are not a scanned electronic, uh, a scanned handwritten signature. And the scanned paper document st still remains a paper document. It doesn't become an electronic document. So sometimes it can be easier just to stick with paper if you don't have the money to buy the validated software, then you stick with paper and you make copies of that, and uh, this is um, as good as electronic, just more cumbersome. And uh, this leads to my uh, final slide, uh, which is, I hope that GMP will be the tool that will help you to guide your ship of cell culture production around the icebergs of regulation. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. I'm happy to be here and I'm happy that I can actually see over the podium because that's always something I worry about when I give talks. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is, if that wasn't enough, all that traceability, I'm going to be talking about control now. And so what's controlled in a clean room, the air is controlled, um, how is um, contamination re uh, risk reduced, how is equipment handled, and who can work in a clean room, and how are the procedures controlled, and how are changes dealt with. So this is just a, a little snapshot from Health Canada's website. And so it says that you have to ensure that drugs are consistently produced and controlled. So that's why I'm going to be talking more about control, but I'm going to be not talking about the process itself, but the facility and the people and the equipment and everything that supports the actual production. So what is control during GMP production? Everything, because we're basically control freaks. So you control the air in the clean room, and you're doing, when you're doing that, you're reducing the number of particles in the room, both um, live and non-viable, and that's, that's really what a clean room is. You're controlling the number of air changes that's going on in the room, and the differential pressures between your rooms. You're controlling the cleanliness of the room, the equipment, and everything that you bring into the room. You are controlling the equipment, how it's used, who uses it, and what, um, what types of things can be done on that piece of equipment. You're con even controlling the personnel, controlling who can actually access the clean room. Um, you have to document that they're trained properly, and you have to tell them how to dress. Procedures um, are controlled through standard operating procedures, and there's even an SOP on how to write an SOP. And changes are, are controlled as well. So you can't just make changes on the fly, which is um, something that often people who have worked in R&D have trouble with that part, because that's part of what research and development is, is changing things and making things better. You, once you get to GMP, you can't just change things anymore. And if you do change anything, you have to get lots of approval and there has to be lots of justification. So this is our facility in Edmonton. It's a 10,000 square feet, foot um, facility and it was designed to manufacture cell therapies. So one of the differences with that is some pharmaceuticals, you can actually sterilize them at the end so that's reducing the risk of contamination. In our facility, we are producing cells. So obviously we can't sterilize them at the end, so we have to do a lot of things along the way to make sure that we don't contaminate or cross-contaminate it. So um, the picture above is our floor above our facility, which has all of our air handling systems that actually controls the air in the clean room. So you can see that the air comes down through the ceiling through HEPA filters and then it leaves through um, air returns and then it comes back up and recycles again. So a clean room is essentially you're vacuuming the air through HEPA filters. 
And the faster you move the air, or the more air changes that you do in that room, the cleaner your air is going to be. So you have different classifications of clean rooms. So in our facility, the biological safety cabinet is considered a class A. And that um, class A has certain guidelines that says that you have to have, if you can see the numbers at the top there, in a, in a cubic meter of air, you can't have more than 3,520.5 microns particles in the room in the biological safety cabinet, and you can't have more than 25 micron particles, and you can't have any microbials. In the room itself, that's a class B, and so you, you're allowed to have more particles in the room, and you're allowed to have up to 10 microbials in the room. And so we are, uh, when we're doing critical processes, we're constantly monitoring those particles, and we're using touch plates or contact plates of media, and we're testing the people, the floor, the equipment to make sure that we're not growing anything in there where we're not supposed to. So differential pressure is also controlled. So you can see on the right hand, there's a, a processing room number one. So that's one of our clean rooms. So the pressure in that room, the air pressure, is actually greater in that room than the airlocks that are beside it. And that's simply so that when you open the door leading into that clean room, you're not dragging the dirtier air with you. The air is being pushed out of the clean room when you open the door, and so on as the air arrows go out until you get to the corridor. So cleanliness of the room. So on the top there, you can see that we have to actually manually clean the walls, the ceilings. We have very expensive sterile mops to do, you do that, and stainless steel mop handles that are ridiculously expensive. And we have um, set schedules for cleaning. We have specialized cleaning equipment. Everything that you bring into a clean room, you have to wipe it down. So we wipe it down with IPA whether it's a box of gloves or it's the product, the starting material itself or the media, everything is wiped down. Um, you minimize the contamination by limiting the number of people in the clean room, and I'll explain that a little further in a bit. And then you also are, as I mentioned, constantly testing the clean room or monitoring it, which you can see with the um, Petri dish there to see that you have not broken any of the rules and that you haven't dragged in any microbials with you with anything that you brought in. And as an added bonus, in our facility we have this guy, and after we manually clean everything, we can put this in the room and it uses vaporous hydrogen peroxide and it kills everything. And they actually used one of these in the airplanes that were potentially contaminated with Ebola in, in the States, so it, it does its job. Equipment, so there's lots of records for equipment. Um, every time we use a piece of equipment, we have to say that we used it, what we used it for, keep records of maintenance and calibration. Um, cleaning validation is required on any, ma on any equipment that will have product contact. That's why in the cell therapy field, we use a lot of disposables, because it's a lot easier to buy something use it once and throw it out than to have to prove that you've cleaned it properly between uses. Uh, the equipment must be validated and that is a whole, that I could speak for hours on that but you might not want to hear it. Uh, the equipment has to be monitored and the equipment also includes things like HVAC, so your air handling systems and any gas man manifolds that you have with gases going to your incubators. Personnel is controlled through training records. Um, they have to follow good documentation practices, which there's a whole set of rules around that. There's a lot of gowning requirements, and, and you have to be properly trained how to put the gowning attire on. And in some places, you're even tested. So they will test you after you've put on your gown to make sure you haven't contaminated it, and if you are contaminated, you've got to go through training again until you get it right. And there's restricted access to the clean rooms. But if we look at um, gowning requirements, there's a good reason for this, 
And that's because 80, we can do, have the fanciest clean rooms ever, which our facility costs $26 million to build. So fancy facility, but 80% of the impurities in the clean room come from people. And so everything that else that can be brought into the clean room can be disinfected and sterilized, but people can't. So you have to minimize the number of people that are allowed to go into the clean room is one way of controlling it. You have to have a really good training program and you have to have proper gowning to control all of this, these impurities that come from people. And it's probably the only place that you work where, where the bosses are saying, slow down, don't move so fast. Because you want to actually move slow so that you're not shedding as many particles. And speaking of shedding, check this slide out. Sitting quietly, you are right now shedding a million particles a minute. If you're walking slower, 5 million, a little bit faster, 7.5, and walking 10 million. So, you know, if you think about the person next to you, on either side of you, this whole room, you think about how many... I know it's just before lunch, but... <laughs> we shed up to 100 grams of skin particles per week. So that's why we have to wear the bunny suits and keep all those particles contained so that they're not floating around in our clean rooms. So um, procedures, so SOPs, um, we have to have version control and you do that so that you know that there aren't outdated SOPs out there floating around that some, someone might be able to uh, follow the wrong procedure. So we do that through controlled copies. So someone is actually numbering copies, putting them out on the floor, making sure that the old version comes back before a new one goes out. They must be followed. They must, must be followed. I have worked in research labs where you have a procedure and people kind of follow it. Some people don't even really know they're there, but here we have to follow them. Procedures for everything, like I said, an SOP for writing an SOP, an SOP for mopping the floor. It isn't just SOPs for the scientific part of it. And changes. Changes happen, unplanned things happen, power outages happen, equipment breaks down. Those things happen, but they have to be documented if they do. So we have deviation forms that have to be filled out if something happens. So you have to describe the event, talk about the reason, um, and that takes, that takes some digging to find out why it happened and what actions were taken to correct it. In, and then a whole investigation has to be done to figure out what the impact of that was. And then you have to put in pr uh, corrective and then preventative actions so that it doesn't happen again. And finding out and digging a little further and finding out what the root cause was. If you have a plan change, you can make changes, but there's a lot of work to get that change done because you have to really um, go through and look at risk and say what happens if we make this change and then you have to get a lot of different approvals. So the take home messages that, um, that I'd like you to think about when it comes to GMP is that it is more than just the process that there is all this other stuff that has to be controlled as well, and that's all part of GMP. That you have to have specialized facilities, and the facilities will differ depending on what your product is. And you have to have specialized staff, and not everyone is meant to work in a GMP facility. Some people really like it, and some people really don't. And so, um, that's something to keep in mind if anybody is thinking about following into this career um, in this crazy world of GMP, that um, it is a very, it, even though we're doing science and producing things, it is a very different life day to day. Uh, specialized equipment has to be used, and um, so the, the equipment, even though it looks the same, we have incubators, but our incubators are mapped on every plane in the incubator to say that the temperature in the back corner is the same as the front. We monitor it 24 seven. We get alarm messages on our phones if it goes outside of that temperature. Uh, maintenance is recorded 
daily, weekly, monthly. It's, um, it's all about making sure that it's going to do the same thing today as tomorrow as next year. And specialized documentation where the big joke is GMP maybe just stands for great mounds of paper. And as we get into the electronic world, that's changing a little bit, but um, there is a lot of documentation. But in the end, all of this effort is so that we can produce a safe and effective product. Thank you. <laughs>